great start to this time of worship. Good morning. My name's Carl Zorowski. I'm the pastor here at St. Peter's, as probably everybody in here knows by now. It is great to see you here this morning. I'm glad you're here to worship with us. I want to begin our time together by calling uh, to your attention announcements that are in the bulletin. I'm not going to go through all of these because there are a lot of announcements. That's because there's a lot of things going on here at the church. But a couple things I do want to point out. We do have um, our Sisters in Christ meets on Tuesday morning. Our um, United Methodist Men meets on Tuesday night. We hope you'll come be a part of that. And, of course, we have our, our um, worship service, midweek worship service on Wednesday night with communion. We hope you'll come for that. But, but do go through the bulletin. You'll see there's a lot of things going on here. We have a Bible study this afternoon at 430. I'm teaching a class on the Gospel of Mark. We'd love for you to come out, be a part of that. And uh, there, I know that there are some other people that need to make some announcements. Shannon? Um, I wanted to announce on behalf of Becky Balduck, um, she will be starting the children's Christmas play practice today at 5 o'clock from 5 to 6. If you have uh, any age child, I don't even know what the age grade is, I don't think it matters, um, but if they want to be a part of our Christmas play, we'll be practicing each Sunday up until they perform, I think it's the second week of December. Um, but bring them out tonight at 5 o'clock, she'll be here, we'll get them organized, figure out what we're doing, and uh, we would love to have as many as we could get. Now, Nancy. Good morning. Um, I am here representing the worship committee of St. Peter's United Methodist Church. Um, over the past couple of years, um, especially since COVID, we've had um, difficulty trying to keep um, nursery workers. So the committee met, and what we've decided is to have a paid nursery worker for both services, and then we would just need to have a volunteer as an assistant. With that in mind, um, I would like you to consider in your giving, um, as a uh, designated fund, you can write on your check nursery if you would like to help us to support that nursery program. We are um, committed to sharing the Word of God, not just with adults but with children also, and we want to make sure that our children are provided for and that they are being well taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. And then I believe, Bill, you wanted to share something this morning as well. Good morning, St. Peter's and members of St. Peter's, visitors of St. Peter's United Methodist Church. Good morning. I have um, several items to take uh, to make you aware of. Uh, this is our second Sunday, and outside in the North Axe, you'll see a white cooler. The white cooler is full of prepared meals. That please take those meals, uh, use for yourself, use it for, give it to a neighbor, uh, shut in, someone who's had, there is a need. Uh, those meals are prepared by the helping hands uh, here at St. Peter's United Methodist Church. And the other item on Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., uh, myself and the staff of Martha's Mission will be packing children's backpacks uh, at 3 p.m. here at the church. What, the, what I was asked to do today was talk about tithing. And uh, you're not going to hear the usual message. You'll hear how tithing helps the community. This week, 835 children were provided food for the weekend by volunteers of churches who gather together every week to pack those bags. Forty individuals gathered in Greenville, North Carolina for a full day seminar on food pantries, the things that are needed to run food pantries and these food and these representatives represent a vast variety of churches in the past year over a thousand frozen meals just like the ones out in the North X were made for Meals on Wheels by a family of churches 
If you haven't gathered, churches, Christian community is a theme. 120 people in Hope Mission are served by this church family here on the fourth Saturday of every month. In Martha's Mission, we feed the 5,000. We gather pantry goods to be distributed to those in need. And need is growing ever so much more as each day goes by. A year ago, when the men of the United Methodist Church were helping give out food, a 90 plus year old lady came and spoke to one of our members and said, I never thought I would see the day when I would have to make a choice between medication and food. Let that sink in for a while. The Methodist man member who received that message, his response was, May I pray with you? This church is a very powerful church when it comes to community service. The needs are great in the community. In preparing my lesson plans for Sunday school, I came across a few things. Although you and your circumstances may change dramatically, I remain the same, past, present, and future, throughout time and eternity. This is the basis of your confidence to give generously of your time and money. In my presence, you live and move and have your being. My kingdom is not about earning and deserving. It is about believing and receiving. And in Romans 15, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope for the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, you have heard the needs found and delivered this week. You have heard the needs and, found and heard the service provided over the past year. None of this is available to anyone without the tithing to a church. Our church is one of many who do that. Our church is one of many who have members who tithe. Give generously. A generous heart is shown and demonstrated in your generosity. To these, I lift up all the words of your disciples this morning. In God's praise, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hi there. I'm behalf. I, I'm behalf. I'm here on behalf of the women of the church. Uh, I'm not the leader, but I was elected to make the announcement. So. If you go out in the narthex, when you leave here, you'll see a sign-up sheet for our annual Christmas dinner at Sagebrush Steakhouse, uh, December 12th, 13th, 12th or 13th. I made the thing this morning. I can't even remember. Um, please come out. Any, any women of the church are invited. Any young girls of the church are invited. If you're female, you're invited. Um, we have a room reserved, so there is plenty of space for everyone to come. Make it a mother-daughter night. Bring your best friend. Just come enjoy some good conversation, some good food, and because it's Jesus' birthday, there will be cake. So please come out for cake, if nothing else. Uh, we hope to see you all there. The sign-up sheet will be out there until the night of, and certainly if you need a ride or anything like that, like please let one of us know. We can definitely get you there and back. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's everything. Uh, thank you, hope to see you there. Thank you, and now, who is ready to do some singing and to worship? I invite you to stand. Our choral call to worship is called By My Spirit.
Amen. Gracious Lord, we are so thankful to be here in your presence. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'll pour your spirit down upon this place. You'll fill every corner of this room, fill every corner of our hearts, so that we may leave here changed from having been in your almighty presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> some of the good things that God is doing in our lives. I pray that you've already sensed his presence here this morning. I pray that you've sensed his presence this week. What is something that has happened in your life that you just said God's name is all over this? I think Donna's got something. She's inching her way up here. I am because my husband's in nursery. Maybe I'll stay. <laughs> take a few minutes to share what we did last night. Yesterday afternoon, uh, we went, a group of us went over to Brookdale for a singing, and we sang to the residents there while they were enjoying their dinner, and we did it as part of Veterans Day, so we sang some America the Beautiful and America, we sang all kinds of songs, and we made a joyful noise. And I just, you know, you could see the happiness on the people's faces. There were some who sang along, there were some who clapped along, and then some who clapped. And there was one lady who sat near us who did put her finger in her ear. <laughs> and she was sitting kind of right behind us. Actually, she was sitting next to somebody that I won't call their name out. But anyway, um, it was just a wonderful experience. And the people in our facilities, you know, they... They just appreciate anything we do, and I'm just appreciative of the church that we, we go over there yearly and, and do this for them, and it was just a joy. And so when we do it next year, the more the merrier. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I want to lift up a praise. I got to spend uh, Friday night and yesterday morning at Pilgrimage. Anybody here ever been to Pilgrimage? All right, so you guys you got know pilgrimage can be a rocking place. And the kids at pilgrimage, oh my gosh, they had such a great time. And to feel the energy of the young people in the church and to see the hunger that they have for the Lord. And on uh, one of the themes for pilgrimage this year was God, how God shows up when he's not expected or in the most unexpected way or the most unexpected place. And um, Friday night, they, 
the speaker got up and she gave a talk and, and the kids all listened and, and at the end she gave an invitation and it was just talking about healing and people being need of, in need of healing. And you know, teenagers today, you remember what it's like being a teenager. Some of us in here are still teenagers. Some of us can remember back this morning when I said this, one person, one person, I said, does anybody here, everybody remember what it's like to be a teenager? And one person said, I don't. And I, I won't say who that was, but think back to when you were a teenager, how much you wanted to fit in, how much you were trying to figure out who you were, how much we compare ourselves to other people. And it can be a very angst-ridden time. And so I just saw all these children there who, and young people who were just in need of being loved and feeling accepted. And they gave this invitation. They said, anybody who is in need of healing, come and we're gonna pray for you. And all these young people just swarmed up to the stage. And the young people from our group, from our church, they pushed Amber, my daughter, they pushed her in her wheelchair up to the stage. And they all put their hands on her and they were praying for her. And it was just so powerful. And God's presence was just so thick in that arena. And, and I remember when, when all of this was going on, there wasn't enough Kleenex in the world for all the tears that I was crying. There was not enough Kleenex in the world for all the tears that all the adults were crying in there. And it was just a beautiful moment. And if I hadn't gone to pilgrimage, I wouldn't have experienced that. But what a, what a great experience that was. So I give God all the glory. And I, and I want to lift up a praise for our youth leaders too. They are still there right now with the youth. Um, I'm glad I'm not a youth leader because I don't think I could survive a whole weekend of pilgrimage, but uh, we're thankful for them and their dedication to the youth. So, any other celebrations today? All right, how many people in here know of someone who is hurting right now? Somebody who's in need? Um, at this pilgrimage event, it was all about healing all about how people need healing in their lives. We may not find a cure for what's hurting, but they can still find a healing. And that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna pray for healing for those who are suffering, for those who are hurting. When we come to this time of the service every week, this isn't just one of those little things that we do because it's part of our worship service that we have to check off. This is serious stuff. And I invite you during this time, if there's someone that God has laid on your heart to pray for, you're welcome to come here and kneel at the prayer rails and, and pray for them. I'm going to lead the church here. I'm going to offer up a prayer on behalf of the church family. And during this time, during this prayer, you'll have an opportunity to voice the names of anyone you'd like remembered. Let us pray. O oh, gracious Lord, when we look at the events happening around us, we are reminded of how broken our world has become. And so we bow our heads, acknowledging that you have the authority, you have the power to take what seems upended and set it aright. We know that you alone can fix what's shattered in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We trust that you can restore hope where despair has taken root and shine light where there's darkness. And so with confidence, we lift up prayers for our brothers and sisters who are hurting this day and for all who are in need of a knowledge of your presence in their lives. Especially this day, we pray for these souls we now name before you. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand again, if you're able, as we sing together hymn number 2190 from the faith we sing. It's called Bring Forth the Kingdom. Salt of the earth, O oh people, salt for the kingdom of God. Share the flavor of life, O oh people, life in the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring forth the kingdom of justice. Bring forth the city of God. You are a light on the hill, O oh people. Light for the city of God. Shine so holy and bright, O oh people. Shine for the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy. Christ, we are those who can look ahead to what is coming. Please be seated. As we come together each week, we do acknowledge that we have this problem in our lives called sin, and sin separates us from God. And so when we come each week, we pray together a prayer of confession, bringing those sins, laying them before the Lord, asking for his forgiveness and then receiving that forgiveness and knowing what it is to be at peace with God. So I invite you now to join me in our prayer of confession. Lord of the ages, in our busy lives, we do not always take time to love, to pray, or to sing your praises. We want to be strong, yet we often feel out of control buffeted by the winds of change, burned by the fires of doubt. Forgetting what we cannot see, we ask, why have you forgotten me? Help us trust your presence, even when we feel utterly alone, trapped in our dark night of the soul. With the promise of Christ as our hope, lead us from our own wilderness wanderings into the well-tended garden of your love. Amen.
Hear these words of assurance from the book of Galatians. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now as forgiven children of God, let us stand and share with one another the peace of Christ.
you. Now let's bring the children in here for our children's time. Oh yes, you may join us, Jack. I'm about to pull you away and I need to leave you here. All right, good morning. Good morning. I have something in here, and, and I don't even have to ask you guys to guess what this is, because you already know what's in here, don't you? God is in there, that's right, because that's always the answer to the question. It's always God. No, this is what? It's a mug. It's a pill mug. Yeah, it's a, it's a coffee mug, and it looks like a prescription bottle. And it says on the front, it says coffee. And it's given by Dr. Harold Fieldgood. And it says, drink one mug by mouth, repeat until awake and alert. A good friend of mine <laughs> gave that to me. But I have this coffee cup because I want you guys to understand every single day, one of the first things I do is drink a cup of coffee. I can't start my day without a cup of coffee. Okay. How many other people are like that? Cup of coffee. You have to have a cup of coffee to start the day, right? Oh, but diesel fuel. You have a cup. Well, I've had your coffee, Jack, and it's about like diesel fuel, so I understand. <laughs> but I've got something else in here, too, that I cannot begin my day with, and that is a Bible. Every day I begin my day with a cup of coffee and my Bible. And I open up my Bible every day and I read something out of my Bible because this is where I hear God speak to me, is out of my Bible. Now, you remember I asked everybody how many people start their day with a cup of coffee and a whole bunch of hands went up, didn't they? Okay. Do you think we'd see as many hands go up if I asked how many people start their day with the Bible? I'm not going to ask that question. I hope, I hope that if I ask that, everybody's hand goes up. And if not, work on it. Work on it because this is a great place to start the day. It really is. I can't imagine a day where I don't have a cup of coffee to begin. And I can't imagine a day where I don't begin in God's word. Now, how many of you are old enough to read? Okay, you're not old enough to read yet, right? All right. Well, I know sometimes I'll ask, I'll ask the children, I'll say, okay, so is everybody going to read your Bible every day? And someone goes, well, I can't read. Okay, well, that can happen. And I don't know that you're reading your Bible every day. I hope that you will, and I hope that you'll grow up to be people who love this book and love this word and love God so much that you're not going to be able to start your day without it. Okay, can we pray together? Lord, thank you so much for these beautiful children. Thank you for the uh, big people in their lives that made sure they're here for church today. And we thank you for the opportunity you give all of us to help them love your word so that they will find one day that every day needs to begin in your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, thank you. And now, speaking of God's word, I invite you to stand as we are now going to hear from God's word. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the 21st chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning with the fifth verse. This is Luke chapter 21, verse 5. Hear now the word of God. And as some spoke of the temple how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign when this is about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. 
for this must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and kinsmen and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now in response to this hearing of God's word, let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. spoken to us through your word being read aloud. I pray you will continue to speak through the words that your servant has to offer so that your truths may be heard in this, your house, in Christ's name. Amen. The temple in Jerusalem was the pride and joy of ancient Israel. If you look at the writings of the first, I think it's first century historian, Jewish historian Josephus, he talks about how beautiful the temple was. And he said that it was so magnificent that when the sunlight hit it, it was like looking at the sun. Just absolutely beautiful. The building, the temple was the center of life in the community of God's people, the Israelites. The people loved the temple. They loved all that it stood for. Well, today in modern times, people can be that way about their local church. They have a sense of pride in their local church. They have a sense of ownership. They'll refer to it. They'll say, well, that is my church. And I think it's perfectly okay to call a church my church or our church, if you're using that to distinguish it from another church. Someone says, well, where do you go to church? Oh, my church is the one behind the State Employees Credit Union. That's okay. I'm, I'm using that to distinguish this church from another local church. But I don't ever want to say my church because I feel like it belongs to me, like I own it. 
We can't look at a local church that way. We can't look like we own the place or think like we own the place because we don't. I love this church. I love this church building. But I don't want to fall in love with the building. I don't want to fall in love with the traditions of the church to the point that they take precedence over my love for Jesus. I hope that none of us ever fall so in love with our church that that love takes precedence over the need to share the gospel and the need for somebody to come through the doors of the church to hear the gospel. Sometimes I wonder if some local churches are ever more concerned with keeping disciples than making disciples. And when I, when I come down on a local church like that, I'm not pointing fingers at St. Peter's, saying, oh, St. Peter's is doing this. No, I'm saying all local churches fall into this sometimes. It's so easy to do where churches start looking at budgets and things and they say, oh, we got to keep our doors open. How are we going to keep the doors open? And their big concern is keeping those doors open for the sake of institutional preservation. Well, this church has always been here. This church always needs to be here. It was my dad's church. It was my granddad's church. It's my church. I want to make sure this church is going to be here for a long time. And I hope it will be. But I hope that our efforts to keep the doors open are not to preserve the institution, but to make sure those doors are open as an invitation for people to find salvation. That's why the church's doors need to stay open. We can get, people in a local church can get too comfortable with the local church. We can get too comfortable with our way of doing things. And when that happens, this man-made institution of church becomes the center of our focus. And our love for our church can detract from our love for the Lord. It can detract from our love for others. That was the case with the temple in this story that, that Luke tells. Because the people there had become so focused on the building, and the building was magnificent, but they became so focused on the building, the structure, what they had crafted, what they had created, what they had built up, that that's what they were, that's where their focus was. Now, the temple certainly had a history. And these stones that they're pointing out to Jesus those stones represented that history. Those stones also represented the present. And they looked at those stones and they felt that those stones also represented the future. But the future was unknown. Their love for the past had deceived them into thinking that the future was going to look the same. They're telling Jesus, look how beautiful this building is. And Jesus says, don't fall in love with the building. Don't fall in love with the temple. Don't become obsessed with the temple. Don't become hung up on what goes on within the temple. Because one day the temple will be gone. It's only temporary. And everybody found out a few years later in 70 AD when when Jerusalem was under the siege of the Roman army that Jesus was right because the temple was destroyed. And I mentioned earlier the historian Josephus. You can go back and see where Josephus describes the destruction of the temple and it's pretty horrific. I mean, I'm not even going to talk about it here in worship because it is brutal what happened that day. But the temple fell just as Jesus said it would. And that's a reminder for us that humanity has no handle on the future. 
We have no handle on what is to come. God does, but we don't. And as Jesus is talking to these people who are marveling at the stonework in the temple, he's addressing a bigger issue than the building or the building falling down. Jesus is talking about the problems with man-made institutions and misplaced priorities. He's addressing the human tendency to focus more on temporary things than eternal things. To focus more on what we have here and now than what God is promising us in the future. In this story that Luke shares, the people are obsessed with what they have, with the way things are. They say, look at this beautiful stonework, Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, it's really beautiful. But buildings don't last forever. And this one's going to fall. Human institutions don't last forever. Don't put your faith in them. This temple will fall. And the people say, all right, well, when is it going to happen? Tell us what signs we need to look for so we can be ready. We want a timetable. We need to be prepared. We want to be able to plan for that day. And Jesus I love it how how you can ask Jesus, people ask Jesus in in the scriptures a pointed question and they want a specific answer. And Jesus gives them an incredible answer that has nothing to do with their question, but it actually has a lot to do with their question. But he's trying to get them to think differently. And that's what he does here. He doesn't give them a timetable. He says, there are going to be wars. Nations are going to rise against nations. There are going to be earthquakes, famines, plagues. Sounds like nothing is off the table. Sounds like they've got some tough times ahead. And they did. And that tends to be the way it is with followers of Jesus. We face tough times. Right now, we're facing tough times in the church, in our church. If you have not heard by now, the United Methodist Church is going through a very difficult season right now of disaffiliation. A difficult season of separation. This coming Saturday, we're holding a special conference in Fayetteville where we're going to gather to ratify the disaffiliation of churches who have chosen to leave the denomination. Churches who have said, we're cutting off our ties with the United Methodist Church. They want to leave. Some people call this separation a split. Some people call it splintering. I guess calling it splintering, it doesn't sound as bad as a split. But the fact is, whether you want to call it a split, whether you want to call it a splintering, whatever you want to call it, wherever you are on the issues, what's happening reminds us of a reality that cannot be denied, and that's this. Human institutions do not last forever. Not the temple and not the church. Now, I want to make sure you understand the church as the body of Christ in the world, that's not going anywhere. The body of Christ will always be the family of believers in the world that are connected by God's love. That's always going to be here. That's always going to be a reality. That will never end. But the human institution of church, that is how believers do their life together, Well, that's temporary. That can change. The buildings we use, the songs we sing, the traditions, none of these are permanent. 
And when I say that something's not permanent, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's going to end. It just means it's not going to stay the same. It's going to change. It's subject to change. The church has been subject to change ever since the day the church was formed. When was the church formed? At Pentecost. The church was formed. That is the community of people in the world who believe in Christ was formed that day. And since that day, that community has constantly undergone change. That is how the believers do life together has changed. Sometimes it's been for the better. Sometimes not. Denominations have been formed. I've got a, a dear friend. He's a pastor, Jack Kalenda. I talk about Jack a lot. He preached for me some when I was, when I was sick. And we talked, when we started talking about disaffiliation, Jack said, I'll tell you, he said, I wish the church would go back to before it split the first time, before it split before. I said, what are you talking about? He said, when that German guy got up and nailed that thing to the door of the church, he said, I think we need to go back before then. And I thought, well, I'm not, <laughs> I don't think I agree with you, Jack, because change can be good. And the change that happened that day was change that had to happen. But denominations have been formed. Denominations have split. It's history. Individual churches have been set up all over the world. Individual churches have split. Sometimes over big things. Sometimes over the color of the carpet. But it happens. When people get involved. And you can't have a church without people. But when people are involved and live life together, sometimes that life gets messy. And when it gets messy, you have division. And that's what we are experiencing right now as the people called Methodists. But there's one thing that doesn't ever change. And that's the love of God. The love of God that frees us from our sins does not change. The love of God shown through Jesus giving his life on the cross, that does not change. The love of God that creates community between believers, that does not change. The love of God that flows through believers out to others who need to know that love, that does not change. None of that changes. You know the scripture, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. That is an eternal life. I'm sorry, that is an eternal love and an eternal promise of an eternal life. God's love for humanity is permanent. It's unchanging. What we do with that love, well, sometimes that changes. The choices we make on how to live with each other, that can change. Those things can change. How we do church, it changes. But God's love is perfect and unchanging. The church, not always so. So as Christians, as followers of Jesus, where should our focus be? On the unchanging love of God or on the changing human institution that we call our church? Where should our focus be? To be honest, I'm thankful that the church is subject to change. I mean, I'm thankful for that little German monk who went up and nailed something to the door of a church. Sometimes change is necessary. And the church, to be honest, the church is always in need of change. And I'm not talking about change that comes at our hands or change that comes by our choice. But I'm talking about the church needs the change 
that comes through the transformative power of God to change us. The church can be what God intends it to be if we're not standing still marveling at the stonework. The church can be what God intends it to be if we're not standing in God's way. We've gone through some tough times in the church over the last few years. We've got tough times ahead of us in the church. And to be honest, until Jesus comes back, we're going to continue to have tough times ahead of us. But hear these words from God that were spoken to Joshua. Chapter 1, verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. There will indeed be tough times ahead for us. But thank God we don't have to do it on our own. I offer you these truths in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As our brother Bill talked about earlier, when you look at the church and you look at finances of the church, the finances of the church serve a purpose, and that purpose is to get food into the hands of those who are hungry physically, to get the gospel into the hands of the people who are hungry spiritually. And so as we present to God his tithes and our offerings, there's so many facets to worship there. One is we're saying thank you, Lord, for what you've given to me. We are saying, Lord, we acknowledge that everything that we have comes from you and everything belongs to you. We acknowledge, Lord, you can change this world. We want to help make that happen. We want to be a part of this. And so as we give to the church, we are not only loving God, we're loving our neighbor because we're helping to facilitate the work of the church to reach out to others. So, with a spirit of thanksgiving and a spirit of hope, let us now present to God his tithes and our offerings.
Gracious Lord, as we now give back to you your tithes and our offerings, let this be an act of love, an expression of our gratitude for your love for us, an expression of our love for others. We pray this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. It's not easy to be the church. We are going to face tough times, no matter what. But no matter what we ever face, God is with us. And so even when things seem out of control, we can still sing, it is well with my soul, because we know the Lord is with us. So let us close today with this hymn. Father, 
The grace of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Like a-